Okay, good. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Nicole Vogel. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Military Spouse Programs at the USO, and I'm very excited to be here with Ms. Um, we're at historical quarter six, mm -hmm. and so I'm actually just going to hand it over to you, and so you can about you and where we're Okay, so we are on Fort Myer in Arlington, Virginia, with, uh, I wish we could show you our beautiful view of Washington, D.C. from up here on the hill. Um, this has been the home of the Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff since 1962. So it's an interesting uh, building. It was originally built in 1908, and it was a two-family home. It was for a more junior uh, level officer. And so this fireplace behind us was not here. This was a dividing wall between two sides of the house. There were two families. And when they uh, developed the role of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and they needed a home for them, this house was tapped and demolished some walls in between and added on some more space, and it became the home of the commandant, uh, the, not the commandant, the chairman. Um, so the home, the, an interesting tidbit about the, the home, this is built on land that was owned originally by Robert E. Lee's wife. And so she, um, uh, Mary Anna Custis Lee, and she, the great granddaughter of Martha Washington. Oh, wow. So there's a connection there. Uh, the land was um, obtained by the US government uh, during the Civil War for non payment of taxes. Uh, Robert Lee was not paying taxes to the, the Union government. The, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. was no longer being recognized as seat of power and so for refusal to pay taxes the federal government seized the land and they did at a later point pay the lee family for some of the property but this was originally owned by the uh, uh, martha uh, uh, martha washington's great Okay. So that's an interesting tip about the property yeah that's great and the view is outstanding you can see the cherry blossom Mm -hmm. in the distance so um, yeah we have a great view of the lincoln the washington the capitol and then the library of congress beyond it uh and the river and ballpark actually. yes yeah it's gorgeous so thank you for allowing us to be here today this is exciting mm -hmm. Glad to host you. yeah thank you so we actually love to would love to know who out there we're from who mm -hmm. the the spouses that are, are joining us right now if you can just type in the chat box and let us know where you're calling in from. We'd love to see that. And we'll be checking that out as we go. And also if there's, um, you see that there's a spouse out there that lives close to you nearby, make sure to um, just click on their name and you can also just make a connection together throughout this call. That'd be great. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, okay. So you're a military spouse. How long have you been a military spouse for? So over three, four years. Well, okay. Great. So you know a lot, but we want to know what was life like before you were a military spouse and how much did you know about the military before you got married? Well, I think everybody can agree that, you know, you think you know about marriage and then you get married and there's a lot to learn. It's the same thing with, with growing up in the military or, um, or marrying into the military. I think even people who grew up in the military exposure than being married True. into the military. Yeah. But for me, I grew up with a father who was a World War II veteran, but was not, he had gotten out long before he was married. Um, and I had uh, uncles who had served. We had lots of neighbors who had served World War II, Korea. Um, but it's very different than growing up in a military base. I mean, I never saw a military base per se. Um, until I started dating my husband. So I was lucky to have a lot of friends. Um, our, my husband's friends most right by the point that, that we started dating. And so those spouses were really in helping me understand sort of the, the joys and the challenges of being a military spouse. So this was in the early to mid 80s. Yeah. Um, and they were very honest about it. You know the good the bad the ugly the wonderful things and the not so wonderful things right 
But still, until you do it yourself, you can have someone tell you about the funny stories about previous PCS moves. But until you do one, you actually don't know what one is like. Yeah. So, prepared as well as I could have been by my girlfriends. Yeah. But until you do it, it's just not the same. Yeah. But it's good that you were able to have that network to go to. Because yeah, that's that's everything. And so I guess what we do, what, and I, I want to take a look actually and see who, who we have here. So I see Fort Eustace, Seattle, Fort Leavenworth, Camp Pendleton, Montgomery, Frederick Little Rock, yeah. all, all over the map. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you everybody for that. And um, if you'd like to chat or chat in the type in the chat box, um, this is the next question I'm actually going to ask Ellen is what were your um, challenges you overcame as a new military spouse and what advice would you give new spouses today? And while you're going through that, if the spouse is in the chat box, if you guys want to type about what you knew as a military spouse as well. Well, part of it, um, learning the language and the culture. Um, I grew up in Boston and, and went to an all women's college, but it was no ROTC or no exposure to it. Um, I did do a, a, a medical internship in a VA hospital. It was during peacetime. Um, it was in the late 70s. And, um, even learn any of the lingo doing that job. Uh, it was that was really one of the things while we were dating in Washington, D.C. So I wasn't on um, an active installation where people were um, drilling it out in the field. Um, it, so there was, a, there was a pretty big learning curve on the acronyms. Yes. Um, Still. The big learning curve yes. on the acronyms. Many years before I understood what all of this stuff was on uniforms. Yeah. I, I didn't know ranks. I, it was a, all of that kind of stuff takes a while to digest when you Right. Growing and then they didn't have an app either, I'm sure. No, no, there were no <laughs> cell phones, there was no internet, it was, it was, you know, um, and, and interestingly, the really challenging thing for me was my husband was in school when we got married. Uh, he was at amphibious warfare school at Quantico. So you're surrounded by a bunch of, you, you, you get to learn all about captains and kind of the things that they do and the places that they get stationed and all of that stuff. And then um, he PCS by himself at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, because okay. he was deployed immediately. And um, so all of a sudden, I got this list of names of spouses from the company that he was the company commander for, and um, just sort of was told to keep an eye on them. Oh. So this is in the era of recall outside of your area code is long distance. Yeah. And so I don't know where these people are. They're mostly in North Carolina. Some of them have gone home to live with their families during the six month deployment. And so it's me juggling working full time and then trying to somehow contact these, these people and say hello, right. I'm married to the company commander, blah, 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 blah. So that was that was an interesting learning curve because when we got married, there was no formalized. Uh, really, not, I don't think any of the services were funding organized family readiness program. So it was all spouses, and it was you know flying the seat of your pants. Not a lot across the services or within a service, and so. Other people who had already done the position were, were telling you. So I was, you know, on the phone with other company commanders, supposed to say, what do I do? How do I take care of this? And, and very shortly, we started organizing. And so you really developed, um, you know, program. And so you could, you could go to a training program and they gave you a binder that you could look up things about conflict resolution. Yeah. Um, how to con ways to stay in touch with people you could do uh, phone calls you could do a newsletter which would be printed off by the command and then mailed out so kind of by the time you got the information 
an awful lot of them, sorry. <laughs> That's so you're true. sort of sending out the same, the same information and a lot of them would get returned because you didn't know if you had the right address and people might decide part to move and then you didn't get an address and right. the phone numbers were really wrong. So it was, <laughs> it was a really interesting time of tracking people down. Right. Um, and then over the years, it just got more and more organized. Mm -hmm. and, and we, we had intranet, which was within the unit. So I could, on my desktop, I could, um, it was more like a word processor. I could type up a document, send it to the office, and they could send it out as a newsletter, which was a huge savings in time. Yeah. Um, and you could actually do word processing instead of typing on a typewriter oh, yeah. and bringing it to be literally like a mimeograph and sent out. So every, you know, there was a constant progression of technology being utilized to, to find better communications. Um, and it was just a godsend when they started having cell phones where, you know, didn't cost you any more to dial outside of your, your area code and to, uh, be able to actually have um, a computer that you could hook up and you could email out yourself right. without having to go through the office. You could email out a newsletter and you could receive information from people. And um, it was much more efficient. You know, you could put out a list of who in the organization got promoted or had a baby and share news, whatever. It was much easier. And so now it's, you know, it's... Oh, it's, it's Pick up your phone and you can get information being tweeted out from the command, Facebook pages. So it's been immense change yeah. that, you know, we had to do it old school because there, there was not the technology to do it any other way. Right. And that created this great need to rely on other people. Yeah. So you had to That's true. learn how to navigate things by talking to other spouses, by, you know, more seasoned spouses or people grown up in the military and then um, when you needed assistance you had to get on the phone yeah right that was just it you had to call somebody right because there was no other way to get that information which is so important because now it could be a simple text or a message through social media and it's just not that instant right and you could tell the tone of someone's voice it's true you um, if you knew the person, you could tell what their mood was by their voice. Right. And if you didn't know the person, um, you had to be careful about your voice and make sure that it was it was welcoming and not bored. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> right? I really don't want to talk to this person. You know, you, yeah. you, you controlled your voice to make sure that the other person knew that. Right. Um, and so there's so much more room for confusion will type in all caps because they didn't realize they had the caps button right their laptop or their phone and people can interpret that as like you're yelling at right. me what I where do in reality say. yeah in reality they just didn't realize that and once you start in all caps you figure i'm just going to go ahead right um, it looks nice no. so um, <laughs> i feel like there's a little bit more room for confusion when you don't see the person face to face You need to be um, you need to be a little more careful about how you write things if you don't want to be mistaken in your intention. Right, and don't take the face to face or the phone call for granted. That's important. Right. So important. So mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, and we'll just go to the next question here. Um, so um, this past November, you were our one of our key figures for the salute to the military spouse. And you talked about different journeys and paths that uh, military spouses take throughout their duration in the military. Um, can you elaborate on that? And what do you, what did you mean by that? Um, the different journey paths and I, I think people tend to lump groups of, of individuals into one neat package, and people talk about the military spouse experience or. Um, military spouse employment or whatever. And in reality, it's this immense spectrum of people's experiences and how people feel about them and all that stuff. Um, you know, one person loves a military base, another person hates living on them, and 
prefers to live out in the community. And that's all, it's okay. It's all good. It's all based on your individual needs. And so when you talk about this past journey, I think that they, they have to be viewed in an individual mode. Um, not everyone is going to um, get married at the same time, have kids at the same time. It's, right. it's a personal choice that you know you don't necessarily have to do that. And then your decisions about what you're going to do along this journey are all going to be based on the needs of you and your spouse and your family. And so um, you are going to be along this path greeted with lots of different options and opportunities. And then you have to choose what you're going to take advantage of, what's the right situations for your So I was lucky. I worked full time for quite a while um, before I got married, then after I got married. And once we had children, I knew I wanted to work, but I really didn't want to work full time. Right. So I had a very flexible career. And I also just sort of decided that I was going to find things that worked for my child care situation and for, and so my it was not the actor. I, I took the job that fit with for my son, and, um, working the hours and so that was my choice yep. to keep working. Some people's choice may be to stay home. Some people's choices are going to be informed by the fact that they can't daycare except in one setting. Right. So um, if the only option you have for daycare is to pay for a full time, you are going to be maybe more likely to go to work full right. time. Um, and if you can't find any daycare, um, depending on where you are, that's really going to impact your choices for employment. And similarly with uh, arriving at a duty station, some people if their service member is going to go to three, four, five month school, mm -hmm to not go because of housing situations, employment situations, um, because they've decided they're going to stay in their home where they have a job, they have a, a support group, and not go off to well, that's a very brief period of time. And that's fine too. I mean, right. we, we're going to make these decisions based on a lot of things. Other people may opt to go and say, hey, this and the good news is I don't like this place. I'm only there for a few months. Exactly. And so some people will embrace, hey, let's pack up and go to, you know, the next wherever. Yeah. Right. And so um, this also impacts families when it comes to your, your uh, kids' education. Mm -hmm. and so um, we end up seeing a lot more geographic separations yeah. as the children get older and the impact of school on the child's education becomes greater. So that those are going to places where um, they're very concerned about their special needs child or their child, especially when you get to high school and the kids are playing varsity sports. Right. And they're like, do I move the kid to the senior year of high school? school to be a varsity player to a new place with a team this late? Um, do I move overseas and try to look for colleges from overseas right. yeah and all of that stuff and there's kind of no right path except what works best for your family and you have to recognize that any geographic separation is a huge impact on the marriage and the family right that it's not as easy as we're all going to stay here and my service member is just going to go and life is just going to go on the same. It's not going to be the same because the service member is gone. And then the impact on the service member of not having your family there. There is a price to be paid no matter what you choose. Right. So the price is to choose wisely and weigh out all of the impacts that are going to happen. The impacts on the children not having their service member parent there. Mm -hmm. The impact on you of not having that extra hand. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it. There, there is, yeah. You're gonna rob Peter to pay Paul somewhere right. along the line with all of these decisions, and then each family has to make up their mind about what is the right decision for them, and weigh in on it. And at a certain point, the kids do get a vote. Right, that's true, absolutely. So um, the, the journeys are going to be different for everyone. Journeys about um, having kids. 
is it employment, how that figures into it, um, the decisions about going with the service member, staying behind, those are all individual decisions that can't be mandated. It does come into play, opportunity to take a leadership role if you are going to be separated from your command sergeant major. It is difficult. You have to think about how we still be a presence for those families True. and take care of those families and, and be a mentor for them if I choose not to go to that place. Same thing with anybody in a commander's role. And so you may want to, I can't go. Um, and there are all sorts of situations. Kids with, with who have needs, kids who have um, athletic opportunities that they're not going to get if they go to that mm -hmm. place. Um, at a certain point, many of us are facing sure. and that is a huge impact now, especially for, you know, for agents and for senior leaders in that our parents are up there. There are health issues to a foreign country when I'm the only child and I have a not so healthy set of parents back here, what do I do? Right. Um, figure that out themselves and make a decision. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it's to be completely happy with either decision you make. Right. But every, yeah, every military family story is, is different and right. it's, it's not fair compared to somebody else's. Right. to draw parallels between, in, in certain ways, we are not so different than many of our civilian counterparts. Mm -hmm. They do not stay in the town where they grew up. They go to educational opportunities somewhere else. They go to job opportunities somewhere else. And you still have to make decisions about where's where we're going to live. So one spouse gets a great opportunity for a job in a place with terrible schools. What do you do? Right. Um, you have kids with special education needs or medical needs. Is the place where your job opportunities are the same good opportunities as another place? Right. You know, it, it, is a, it is a part of life that you have to make these decisions and ours are further complicated by duty stations overseas, duty stations in remote areas, not necessarily being able to pick your duty station, things like that. Yeah, well, something to consider and very well said. So thank you. Let's see, I'm gonna check the chat box. Okay, good. So you guys have some conversations going on in the chat box. We really appreciate that. And we'll make sure we take a look at that later on as well. So, um, okay, a couple more questions. Um, what is for you? What do you well, do? I, I <laughs> there I, is there a typical there day? There is no <laughs> as a typical day. And that was probably one of the, one of the different uh, adjustments I've, I've had to make over the years. Um, I stopped working in two years. We were, we were moving to California. It was a, a much bigger role for my husband, and he was dual headed with a command in, in Camp Florida and in California. So if I went to work in California, it was going to be really hard to get to Tampa once a month yeah. to give some love to my Tampa families. And then uh, there were opportunities for more travel and going off. Would I be able to go see our families in 29 Palms? Yeah. But, you, you know, would I be able to see our deployed service members? and? So decision on my part that um, I had worked okay. and decided that I would I would forego that yeah. because I just couldn't see how I was gonna too many hats yeah yeah be able to do all of that other stuff and so um, I I think the ability um, that kind of came with that position. My husband was the math commander. Um, a, like a really big change for me because no longer volunteering on Tuesdays, you know, with a with a certain organization, non nonprofit that I would spend my Tuesdays with. Sure. You know, it just became um, it just became more complicated. 
and my days changed. And in this role, especially, right. we are overseas a lot. We are traveling around the world, traveling around the country. Uh, the uh, path that I chose to take for working with organizations was very different. Previously, I would just sort of hitch my wagon to one or two organizations, and they were sort of service centric be because I was, you know, a, a, a spouse representing a particular service. And so that changed coming to this role. And um, I was not going to be affecting, I'm not going to be putting my finger into anybody else's pie, telling service chief to do with their family right. readiness programs, with um, how they dealt with organizations. That's just not what your job is. And so I um, decided that the place that I could have the most impact was being aware of what was going on with different service organizations and trying to bring together those organizations to better serve our service members. So instead of um, a lot of independent bus functioning, I wanted people to sort of stay in their lane become really good at what they do, and then use all of those other organizations to fill the gaps that maybe weren't in their best skill set. Okay. And so what I worked on over the past three and a half years was linking together all of these people doing good and helping them to do better by their service members, not making more programs, right. but by taking advantage of what somebody else already does mm -hmm. very well. Right. But I'm not going to go to the grocery store to have my oil changed. Right. <laughs> I'm going to go to the grocery store for groceries and then I'm going to go to need to have my car serviced. And you wouldn't twice about it. the grocery store wouldn't say, well, we have all these people have to have their oil changed. Maybe we should do this. You know, you, you have that to some of the big box stores do a lot of different sure. things. But um, in general, we sort of go to the dry cleaner for the dry cleaner. Right. And so um, we have to watch for mission creep sure. among our, our service organizations and say, what do you do well? What, what do you want to be your expertise? And then what other monk among your population? And do you know how to do a warrant handoff to another organization? that can fill in those gaps and maintain these close relationships with other organizations so that you really know them and you understand who they can do. Yeah. So that's what I chose to focus on. Okay. But there's no prescribed, there's no prescribed you know, role position. You kind of don't own anybody, but you own everybody. Yeah. So you want to for everyone, but you're not getting into the weeds of somebody else's people. Right. So um, it's an interesting role. I believe, it. yeah. It's very interesting, okay. and especially when you're 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 meeting with your foreign counterparts and you're trying to, to understand how does you do it. Is there something to lean from their right their methods um, that might be a benefit in our society, but uh, are immensely different than many other countries, just in the size and the scope where our people are stationed. So a lot of it was me educating other countries about the things that are done in the United States. Right, yeah. Have you, have you seen anything um, in a country that you think would work well for us, or is it? Um, well, one of the things, I mean, especially in the smaller countries um, where uh, places you can get to the farthest you know, the farthest duty station away is maybe a four hour trip. Yeah. So that families stay put and their service member tends to go. And what I really learned is that those people overlap in their communities. Yeah. They are very engaged in their own communities and they don't have governmental organizations filling in for the problems. They don't have a lot of military systemic family readiness programming because they are fully in their communities. Right. And I think that that's a great point for us to know that we um, we have a tendency to turn to our services and say, why don't you have a program? For sure, us? absolutely. When maybe we need to be looking at our communities and saying, 
gee, what's out there already around me? Because most of our service members' families live in the civilian community, that there's um, less of what's right around me here in my community that I could take advantage of. We have some geographic different yeah. differences. It's really too hard. Most of our families will go with their service right. member um, because um, you can't just, they can't just hop on a train and be home in one hour, two hours, four hours. Right. 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 But I do think that, that understanding of the play of um, community around you, taking care of your family is really important. Yeah. Well, and going from the community and, and your, you know, your home base, once you move to a new location, um, do you know how many PCSs you've done? This is our 19th house. <laughs> when we moved in, it was our 19th house in 30 years. Okay. That is amazing. So with those 19 moves, how did you make each move your home base and how did you establish new works at each location? You know, it, I think I was very lucky um, to have married him during the period where um, you couldn't call home all the time. You all um, back to your old duty station all the time because you just couldn't afford it. Yeah. I mean, long distance phone bills were expensive. So you had to rely on the people around you. So sort of a lot of, we tried to live on military bases when we could. Um, to help give my husband also a short, much shorter commute to the office. Any point in adding another half an hour to his commute to a duty station if we could avoid it. Um, I remember so many times my big old moving van out in front of my house <laughs> and a neighbor coming over and saying, you know, hey, what can I do for you? Here's some brownies for movers or bringing over sandwiches. I mean, we had neighbors who brought over a bunch of subs. Um, for the moving crew and for us just to make it easier while we were unpacking um, people coming over and staying you know um, I'll, once, once the moves go i'll tell you the commissary is so you can get groceries you know people are just very outgoing and friendly and so that was a great example the same way absolutely everywhere that i went our first pcs i did by going to okinawa oh wow well. So literally, it was a father and son who came and packed up our little the one bedroom. Yeah. Just we thought we were moving into a mansion. We moved to Camp Lejeune <laughs> into a three bedroom. Wow. House. That's huge. If you had a small. I didn't have enough furniture. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I just didn't have any furniture for it. You know, we, it was it was amazing. We thought it was just giant, and it had a uh, washer dryer space. In the back, so the first thing we did was buy a washer dryer. Yeah. And it Thank was very, very exciting um, to that. have all this space. And so um, mm -hmm. I had very low expectations, <laughs> right. apparently. Um, and so uh, I think the first thing you do is you realize that you know, you're you all excited. You say, well, I've got to put up some curtains on the windows yeah. so the neighbors can't look in. And um, you're, we were of the generation where we were just just glad to have hand me downs because the thought, the overwhelming thought of buying fur, um, yes. you know, so that was our, our big adventure. We bought dining room furniture, and so the, the full card table that we had been eating off of right. was, you know, was a big deal. And North Carolina seemed to be the place to buy furniture. Mm -hmm. So, so you just sort of learned that you, you know, first thing you 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 had to get your kitchen and your bedrooms up, and everything else. Could and then um, very rapidly sort of figured out, okay, curtains on the desk for privacy, then um, getting those boxes of um, the things that you have to use all the time. Right. Um, and sort of the last thing you worried about were the, for me, was the, the kind of the unnecessary tchotchkes that were the decorative yes. function first. And then after that, you could sort of, and so for me, it was more like I knew I had settled in when I had like a nice doormat out front yep. and I had a place that people could walk into and actually sit down. 
have company over. Right. And there might still be a back bedroom that, you know, was like a bomb shell. But when I could finally invite neighbors over and have some lunch or have them sit down in my living room, that's when I knew that. You were home. Yeah, I love that. And this is just a random question, but after each PCS, since you've been moved, when do you decide I need to get rid of this this object that I haven't put out after you know the third or fourth? Yes, are you able to get rid of that? Just I really it really depends on what it is. We, we sort of unloaded in a way that useful didn't fit. Yeah. Um, you gave the old sofa when you bought a new right. One. I mean, we were living in homes. We didn't really, we didn't really have a spare place to put. Stuff. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then it, it was a matter of as the kids grew up, uh, have, do a yard sale and unload their yeah. stuff that we didn't. We gave away a lot of little type stuff in the yard, etc. Because my kids outgrew it because just why? Were, what were, right. You know, exactly. Just give it to a neighbor with. It was a little bit younger, um, and so the where it got harder was when my husband had commands, and then uh, buy a bunch of entertaining stuff. Yeah, like you're buying some chafing dishes so that you can do unit events at the house, and you're buying extra plates, and you're buying serving bowls, and all of a sudden you're accumulating entertaining items. Right, and um, so you. You use them periodically, but then you know, maybe you also use the neighborhood mm -hmm. stuff or whatever. So you hang on to this stuff. Right. You know, the, the chafing dishes that get brought out three times a year, you're still hauling it around. Yes. Uh, uh, folding chairs. I mean, yeah. what good military family doesn't have a <laughs> couple of folding tables and folding chairs to haul out right. when you need more? So, um, the first time where I felt like all of a sudden, what do we do with all our personal stuff? Right. Was uh, I would send out to one map from California, which was shocking. Folding chair and this is what folding tables and the camps. Oh. Yes. Pretty cool. Yes. And so, yeah. um, <laughs> so, uh, still using a bunch of my stuff because the house didn't have all the entertaining mm -hmm. stuff. But um, became the assistant commandant at the Marine Barracks. Yeah. Materials and spare chair. And so, um, so I stopped in the purchase mode. Yeah, right. And mixing my things with what was in the home. Painting sort of got more and more organized, and it wasn't me running to Costco buying a lot of little hors d'oeuvres to throw on yes. some nice trays and serve while I'm trying to entertain 30 people in my house. <laughs> Formal, I right. had some assistants, and my husband had an aide who would manage the house and make sure that, um, you know, we could do a dinner and then I could be entertaining guests and not back in the kitchen stir pot. Right. So, um, it, you sort of get to where um, someone's going to have them, but then um, furnishings, you kind of keep them because yeah. you just don't know what's going to fit in the next house. Right. And so um, we had some of this old dining room set in China cabinet went into storage because there was some of them in the house. It was awesome. You just let somebody else. Somebody else's furniture got damaged, or you <laughs> sat upon yeah. um, instead of yours. But you just kind of didn't ever know when you were going to. Get them. So you hold on to the stuff, and you hold on to the stuff, because well, you know, if we retire, I'm going to need this thing, some stuff, right? And so, um, so we uh, have gradually gotten rid of things. Um, you know, gave away all the kids' twin beds because my sons are too tall to even fit in. <laughs> yeah. um, and so we just would call up a charity nearby and say, yeah. hey, what's a first? Yeah. How about it? Take yeah. all these twin beds. <coughs> you want the dress? 
Yes. Um, and so we, we, we have unloaded somewhat, but um, this is going to be have to be a big one. Yeah, this will definitely. This, this will be. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, before we open it up for questions here, um, what's next after you transition out of the military? Uh, so we will be moving back to, we'll be moving out of the, the D.C. area. We will be in Boston area. We have okay. a home there and um, have, still have some family up there. Okay. So we will be moving back up there and uh, taking some recuperation time to um, have a couple of months to sleep and uh, get release himself from his, his uh Myself for a few months. Unplug. Yeah, kind of enjoy ourselves. We have a family wedding. Oh, good. Coming up, my daughter is getting married, so we will have a wedding to get prepared for. And um, frankly, I feel like we have boxes and boxes of stuff that we probably will not have time to um, to weed through. Right. Um, I mean, just files and books and. Um, we probably want just to figure out what we should keep and what we shouldn't. And I don't really see us having time to do that before, um, before retirement. So those of you who know what I'm talking about, who've retired and <laughs> have opened up boxes and said, why do we have this? I mean, I think we're going to be right there with you. Yep. <laughs> Wondering why we have some of these things, but just not having time beforehand to go through. And then we'll just figure it out from there. Right. Yeah. Cause you'll have time. Right. Maybe. You never know. <laughs> we'll still keep our hands involved with some organizations. We will, you know, we will want to support all of these groups doing good work uh, for our service members and our veterans. We'll still absolutely be supporting them 100 percent. We'll just find the other at the time right. to get our personal life yes. organized. Very important. Good. OK, right. thank you for that. Let's check out the question and answer box or question, um, yeah, box here. Okay, and you are more than welcome. If, if anybody has any questions, please just type the question in the Q&A box and, and we'll make sure that we, we get to it. So uh, Maria wants to know, um, okay, if you had one tip to give to a new military spouse, what would that be? Um, absolutely, my tip would be to embrace um, there are when I first arrived I sort of went wow um, not quite used to and I will tell you every single time we're, we're stationed I found people that I just absolutely loved I found things to do that were wonderful and different I found um, adventures are around every corner if you choose to accept and fabulous people are around every corner but you've got to get out there and find them and find your your tribe find your people make you it yourself they're there and they may be at your gym and they may be volunteer place they may be in a job they may be your neighbors in the neighborhood um, our neighborhood in alexandria had uh great group of people that we did um, an annual Christmas ornament swap and we did a fall Oktoberfest cookout and things like that. Um, I could have stayed in my house and never gotten to know those people or I, I, I chose to get out and there was a garden group. I mean, just great things to do everywhere. But not will drag you yeah. in. It's true. You do have to put out some effort to, you do have to be accessible if people approach you. You have to sometimes take the first steps. Um, and I, I think people rarely regret um, jumping in and meeting their community. Yeah, it's true. And it's, you know, and that's a military spouse, but that's every time you, you move, you really need to just try to get involved as much as you can. So. Right, and, and that includes in your job. You can yeah. decide to just show up at work every day to do your hours and depart, or you can get to know those people. And professionally, I gained a huge amount from getting to know other physical therapists who had different 
treatment skills and who had attitudes and and it was huge for me to get to know all of these different people around the country working in different types of facilities and it made me a much better physical therapist and then i would say um, learning how to be a good neighbor yeah true was um was really helped by living in different communities because there's kind of a different vibe everywhere you go same thing with command there's sort of a different vibe and it's not right or wrong it's just different right, right. good okay See here. I'm gonna take a look. Okay. That so, font is way too small. I know. For me I to read. So I, I know apologize. Why I'm <laughs> at it. Um, what has been a successful strategy you've used for balancing a or professional life or career with the portability movement demands of a military life? I think I just expected that I would have to adjust things at different stages for my kids. So when I was having my kids and they were babies, I uh, found a great facility five miles from my house. Um, the pay was not great, but they had on-site daycare. And so I just had to juggle with the other therapists, you know, so they didn't have too many kids in the daycare. I, I figured out my work days based on you know, how many kids would, would be acceptable into the daycare. And, um, I just did that everywhere I went. I figured out what is my childcare situation and how does that work for finding work. And so sometimes I got paid a lot of money and right. I still had good daycare. Right. And other places, not so much. But I also viewed it as, um, well, we're going to PCS. You know, I have to say the, the vein of physical therapy that I chose, pediatrics, is not known for being well paid. So I, I sort of knew that going into it, um, but I absolutely loved what I did. And um, I picked what fit for my family mm -hmm. and what I knew I would really enjoy. Yep. And that was it. And, and the times when I made a lot of money was great. And the times when I didn't make a lot of money, I was still working in my profession, getting experience and being able to um, People care for right. I and mean, at one job, I had a, a great teaser. My 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 boss was actually a dear friend who um, had also had kids a little bit older than mine to entice me to work. She said, "Okay, so you can get your kids into the breakfast care at school, and my husband will pick up all of our kids and bring them to the clinic." So you don't have to worry about Perfect. the after school care part right. of it. And so we would we had an empty treatment room and we just sort of shoved all the kids in there. Yes. They had a snack <laughs> and played with therapy toys and that. and that was it. And that was that was my hook to, you know, work the empty like, oh, I don't have to worry about picking up my kids afterwards. Right. It was already taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. So um just I tell you, I found people who found creative ways of working a job. And during summer breaks, I put them into all day camp uh, on base. Yeah. And then um, had a, a friend's daughter who was a teenager watch them for very brief okay. periods of time, kind of filling the gap to right. me getting home. So. Yeah, you just kind of work it. I was in a babysitting co-op at one point. <laughs> I recommend them. Oh. It was 30 the neighborhood who came up with a charter and no money was exchanged. We had little tokens that were each worth 15 minutes of child care. Brilliant. And so when you got low, you had to do more. And then when you had a lot of tokens, it meant you needed to go on date night. And yes. It brilliant. So um, I... I'm always impressed by the creativity. I've met families where one person worked Monday, Wednesday, the other person worked Tuesday, Thursday, and they watch each other's kids. And then they still had Friday. When? Yeah, that sounds cool. I love it. Okay, so. Okay, what is the best piece of advice you have for little ones who have a hard time being separated from a dad or a mom? Um, to a certain extent, they're 
the more about child development and and attachments and all of that, it's very helpful because you learn that some of it is just natural. Like the times when you drop your kid off at school and they're like crying, like their heart is breaking. And then two minutes after you leave, the teacher's like, oh, they're fine. So I, I think a certain amount of it is normal that they're looking for a parent who did certain things in their life. All these awesome things now that you can do. They're the little dolls that have the face of the service oh, yeah. member on the doll that yeah. are awesome. We can video chat. My husband used to tape record on cassette tapes. This is dating us. He used to read <laughs> books to my kids on the cassette tapes, and then the kids could put it in their little tights, little, little tiny no-brainer cassette that they had, right. that they could put it in and they could just press play the stories. And now we have United Through Reading, and we have um, all sorts of great events through USO, et cetera, that mm -hmm. do kind of um, recognition service member, all sorts of lovely programs at installations that help you to service member. You can FaceTime. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So just. You can video on the phone <clears throat> and have that readily available. Right. That yeah. we've got it, you know, if you're at the restaurant the kid is acting up you can say oh here Dan, right there you take go. a look yeah and keep them entertained so i think i think all of that stuff works well and we did the chains too where you you have a deployment chain for every day and then you take every day that passes by oh. that your service member is gone and then because you never actually knew the date they were coming add a couple more i've never heard of that before or okay, i like to make it work. Some people used to do jelly beans in a jar, you know. I like that. Members coming home soon. Good. All right. So, all right. Looking back on your time raising kids as a military spouse, do you have any regrets or anything you would have done differently in regards to helping your kids navigate life as military dependents? Um, <laughs> Moms are always wondering if we're doing it right. So the way you know you did it right is that your kids grow up and they're not axe murderers or something. <laughs> you, you know, it's really hard to just kind of second guess. And then each kid has their own unique personality. And what works for dealing with one child absolutely doesn't work with the other one. Three kids and they're like three corners of a triangle. And, you know, one of them you can look at, and, you know, for a and they fall apart and they're like, oh. oh. And then the other one is like, Pfft. right. <laughs> so what? Um, and so I, I think to a certain extent, you are, you are trying to deal with your unique personalities, your unique personality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we tried not to hover over them and step in when they didn't need your help. And, and um, you know, I, I am actually pretty happy raised our kids. They are really nice adults, good people who have all done service work. And I, I think um, I think the biggest thing I tried to do, and probably learned this working in pediatrics, was you have to step back and let kids fall. Yeah. You have to let them fail and you have to let them fall. And I, I mean, there's a lot of yeah. <laughs> Where you want to jump. And so I, I, I think that that's really the test for a parent is to step back and say, is harm going to be done? Is this, is not going to not learn something because I intervene? And is it better for them learn this lesson? And you ask yourself some of those questions like that. Do I, am I really needed here? Right. Or should I just shut up and have some tissues ready? Right. Oh, um, yeah. That's really the, the big thing that we sort of learned. And each kid is so different. Some kids need a little more protecting. Some kids are a little more sensitive and have kind of struck that a little bit more. And others really don't want you getting in their business. And they're good with falling down. 
they know they can always come back. Yes. The mature kid um, inhibits some of your desires that may be your kids developing independence. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, you know, I mean, I learned they're not that breakable. Right. I need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> really not that fragile. You know, as right. long as the biggest thing, as long as they know that you love them and you're there for them, and that there's a set of rules that they have to abide by in life okay. and in the home, True. I mean, no means no. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Meanest mother in the world. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, okay. Well, let's see here. I think, okay. We are good. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If there are any other questions, we'll go ahead and um, see if we can follow up with you afterwards to answer those questions. Um, and I want to thank you again for, for hosting us today. We learned a lot and this has been so much fun. So thank you for that. Um, May 1st, we're going to do our next uh, Coffee Connection Live with Brian Alvarado. He um, is the Senior Manager of Operations and Programs for Military Spouse Programs with Hiring Our Heroes and is also the 2018 Military Spouse of the Year. May 1st at 1 p.m. Standard Time, so we'll make sure to send out the information about that. Um, that would be great. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. He is. We're very excited. Um, any last closing remarks? Anything? Just thanks to everybody who, who joined us today or who's going to join us um, after the fact. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I hope that you re really realize that there is a huge resource of other spouses out there if you just take advantage of it. I mean, there are, there are people who are funny, who are smart, who are um, professional that um, I wouldn't have had nearly the fun that I've had in the past 34 years if I tried to go it alone. Um, so please find other people, reach out, and, and then reach out to help those other people, not just for yourself. And I think you'll find that it makes your life um, so much better, so much richer. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to my team, Daniel Haro, Shanna Help, and Elizabeth Lee for helping me with this as well. Thanks so much. Right. Have a great day.